I told you that the greatest is the same as the smallest, and that I am acting as a servant at this table, and I will serve you even more. So far I have given you food, a service for your bodies. Now I want to give you food for your spirits. It is not a dish of the ancient rite. It belongs to the new rite. I wanted to be baptized before being the master. That baptism was sufficient to spread the word. Now his blood will be shed. Another ablution is required for you. Although you have been purified by the Baptist in his days and also today in the temple, but it is not yet sufficient. Come, that I may purify you. Interrupt your meal. There is something more elevated and necessary than the food given to the stomach to fill it, even if it is holy food as the present one of the Passover rite. And it is a pure spirit, ready to receive the gift of heaven, which is already descending to make its throne in you and give you the life, to give the life to those who are pure. Jesus stands up. He makes John stand up to come out of his place more easily. He goes to the chest and takes off his red tunic and folds it, placing it on his mantle which is there already folded. He girds himself with a large towel, and he goes towards another basin, which is empty and clean. He pours some water into it. He takes it to the middle of the room, near the table, and puts it on a stool. The apostles look at him dumbfounded. Are you not asking me what I am doing? We do not know. I tell you, that we are already purified, replies Peter. And I repeat to you that it does not matter. My purification will serve him who is already pure to become purer. He kneels down. He unties the Iscariot's sandals and washes his feet one at a time. It is easy to do so because the couches are made in such a way that the feet are in the outer side. Judas is astonished and does not say anything. Only when Jesus, before putting the sandal on the left foot and getting up, makes the gesture of kissing his right foot that has already been shod, Judas withdraws his foot violently and with the soul strikes the divine mouth. He does so unintentionally. It is not a strong blow, but it grieves me so much. Jesus smiles, and to the apostle who asks him, Did I hurt you? I did not intend to. Forgive me, he says, No, my friend, you did it without malice, and it does not hurt. Judas looks at him, a worried, elusive look. Jesus passes on to Thomas, then to Philip. He goes round the narrow side of the table and arrives at his cousin James. He washes his feet, and when getting up, he kisses him on his forehead. He passes on to Andrew, he blush, who blushes with shame and makes efforts not to weep. He washes his feet and kisses him like a baby. Then there is James of Zebedee, who goes on grumbling, Oh, Master, 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 you are lowering yourself, my sublime Master. John has already untied his sandals. And while Jesus is bent, drying his feet, he kisses his head. But Peter, it is not easy to convince him to submit to the right. You want to wash my feet? Do not even think about it. As long as I live, I will never allow you to do that. I am a worm. You are God each to his own place. You cannot understand now what I am doing. Later, you will understand. Let me do it. You can do anything you like, Master. You do you want to cut my neck? Do so, but you will never wash my feet. Oh, my Simon, 
Do you not know that if I do not wash you, you will take no part in my kingdom? Simon, Simon, you are in need of this water for your soul and for the long journey you have to take. Do you want to come with me? If I do not wash you, you will not come to my kingdom. Oh, my blessed Lord, then wash all of my body, feet, hands, and head. Anyone who, like you, has had a bath needs only to have his feet washed, as he is completely pure. The feet, man walks with his feet on filth, and it would not be much either, because, as I told you, it is not what enters and comes out with food that dirties, and it is not what settles on his feet on the roads that contaminates man, but it is what smolders and matures in his heart and comes out from it, which contaminates his actions and limbs. And the feet of a man with an impure spirit go to orgies, to lust, to illicit business, to crimes. Therefore, among the various parts of the body, they are the ones that have much to be purified. With the eyes and mouth, O oh man, man, a perfect being for one day, the first one, and then so corrupted by the seducer. And there was no malice in you, man, no sin. And now you are all malice and sin, and there is no part in you that does not sin. Jesus has washed Peter's feet. He kisses them. And Peter weeps and takes Jesus' two hands in his own big ones, and he rubs them against his eyes, and then kisses them. Simon also has taken off his sandals, and without one word, he lets Jesus wash his feet. Then, when Jesus is about to pass on to Bartholomew, Simon kneels down and kisses his feet, saying, Cleanse me from the leprosy of sin, as you cleansed me from the leprosy of my body, that I may not be confused in the hour of judgment, my Savior. Be not afraid, Simon. You will come to the heavenly city as white as mountain snow. And what about me, Lord? What are you going to say to your old Bart? You saw me in the shade of the fig tree, and you read my heart. And now, what do you see? And where do you see me? Reassure a poor old man who is afraid he may not have strength and time to become what you want him to be. Bartholomew is deeply moved. You must not be afraid either, I then said. Here is the true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now I say, here is a true Christian worthy of the Christ. Where do I see you? On an eternal throne, dressed in purple. I shall always be with you. It is Judas Thaddeus' turn. When he sees Jesus at his feet, he cannot control himself. He rests his head on his arm, laid on the table, and weeps. Do not weep, my sweet brother. You are now like one who must endure the extirpation of a nerve, and you think that you will not be able to stand it, but it will be a short pain. Then, oh, you will be happy because you love me. Your name is Judas. And you are like her great Judas, like a giant. 
you are the one who protects. Your actions are those of a lion and of a young roaring lion. You will rouse the impious who will withdraw when you face them and the wicked will be terrified. I know. Be brave. An eternal union will strengthen and make perfect our king kingship in heaven. He kisses his forehead as well as he did for his other cousin. I am a sinner, master, not me. You were a sinner, Matthew. You are now the apostle. You are one of my voices. I bless you. How far have these feet walked to come more and more forward towards God? Your soul urged them, and they left every way that was not my way. Proceed. Do you know where the path ends? On the bosom of your father and mine. Jesus has finished. He takes the towel off and washes his hands in clear water. He puts his clothes on, goes back to his seat, and while sitting down he says, You are now pure, but not all of you. Only those who wanted to be so. He stares at Judas of Cariath, who feigns he does not hear him, intent as he is on explaining to his companion Matthew how his father decided to send him to Jerusalem, a useless conversation, the only purpose of which is to give an attitude to Judas who, however bold, must feel ill at ease. Jesus pours wine into the common chalice for the third time. He drinks and makes the others drink. He then intones, and the others sing in chorus, I love because the Lord hears my voice of my prayer. Because he turns his ear towards me, I will invoke him throughout my life. The throes of death had surrounded me, etc. Psalm 114, I think. A moment's pause. He then resumes singing, I had faith, that is why I spoke. But I was deeply humiliated, and in my dismay I said, Every man is untruthful. He looks fixedly at Judas. My Jesus voice, which is tired this evening, regains vigor when he exclaims, The death of holy people is precious in the eyes of God, and you have broken my chains. I will sacrifice a victim of praise to you, invoking the name of the Lord, etc. Psalm 115. Another short pause, and he, and he then resumes, Praise the Lord, all nations praise Him, all peoples, because His mercy has been asserted upon us, and the truth of the Lord lasts forever. Another short pause, and then a long hymn, Sing praises to the Lord, because He is good, because His mercy lasts forever. Judas of Cariath sings so much out of tune that twice Thomas brings him back into tune with his powerful, loud, baritone voice and stares at him. The others also look at him because he is generally in tune, and I've had the impression that he is proud of his voice as he is of everything else. But this evening, certain sentences upset him so much that he sings false notes, and certain glances of Jesus underlining those sentences have the same effect one of them is, it is better to confide in the Lord than to confide in man. Another one is, when I was pushed, I staggered and was about to fall, but the Lord supported me. Another is, I shall not die, I shall live and narrate the deeds of the Lord. And finally, these two that I am going to relate now strangle the traitor's voice in his throat. The stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone and 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When the psalm is over, while Jesus is cutting and handing the lamb round again, Matthew asks Judas of Cariath, Are you not feeling well? No, leave me alone. Don't worry about me. Matthew shrugs his shoulders. John, who had heard, says, The master is not well either. What is the matter with you, my Jesus? Your voice is weak, like the voice of a sick person or of one who has wept much. And he embraces him, resting his head on Jesus' chest. He has only spoken a lot, as I have only walked a lot and got cold, says Judas nervously. And Jesus, without replying to him, says to John, You know me by now, and you know what makes me tired. The lamb is almost consumed. Jesus, who has eaten very little, and has only had a sip of wine at each chalice, but to compensate for that, has drunk a lot of water, as if he were feverish, resumes speaking. I want you to understand my gesture of a short while ago. I told you that the first is like the last, and that I am going to give you a food that is not corporeal. I have given you a nourishment of humility for your spirits. You call me Master and Lord. You are right, because so I am. So if I have washed your feet, you should wash each other's feet. I have given you an example, so that you may do what I have done. I tell you solemnly, no servant is greater than his master. No apostle is greater than he who appointed him. Try to understand these things. Then, if you understand them and put them into practice, you will be blessed. But not all of you will be blessed. I know you. I know whom I chose. I am not speaking of everybody in the same way, but I say what is true. On the other hand, what has been written concerning me is to be fulfilled. He who eats the bread with me rebels against me. I am telling you everything before it happens, that you may have no doubts about me. When everything has been accomplished, you will believe even more that I, I am I. He who receives me receives him who sent me, the Holy Father who is in heaven, and he who receives me and he who receives those whom I send will receive me, because I am with the Father, and you are with me. But now, let us finish the rite. He pours more wine into the common chalice, and before drinking of it, and letting the others drink, he stands up, and everybody stands up with him, and he sings one of the previous Psalms again. I had faith, and that is why I spoke. And then he sings a psalm that never comes to an end. Beautiful, but eternal. I think I have found it, but its beginning and its length as Psalm 118. They sing it as follows. They sing one part in chorus, then in turns. One recites a couplet, and the others, in chorus, sing another part, and so forth till the end. No wonder they are thirsty at the end. Jesus sits down. He does not lie down. He sits as we do, and he says, Now that the old rite has been accomplished, I will celebrate the new one. I have promised you a miracle of love. It is time to work it. That is why I have longed for this Passover. From now on, this is the victim that will be consumed in a perpetual rite of love. My beloved friends, I have loved you throughout the whole life of this earth, of the earth. I have loved you for the whole eternity, my children, and I want to love you till the end. There is nothing greater than this. 
bear that in mind. I am going away, but we shall remain forever united through the miracle that I will now work. Jesus takes a loaf still entire and places it on the chalice that has been filled. He blesses and offers both. He then breaks the bread and takes thirteen morsels of it and gives one to each apostle saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me who am going away. He gives the chalice and says, Take this and drink it. This is my blood. This is the chalice of the new alliance in my blood and through my blood that will be shed for you to remit your sins and give you the life. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is very sad. There is no smile, no trace of light, no color on his face. It is already an agonizing face. The apostles look at him utterly anguished. Jesus stands up saying, Do not move. I shall be back at once. He takes the thirteenth morsel of bread and the chalice and he goes out of the supper room. He is going to his mother, whispers John. And Judas Thaddeus says with a sigh, Poor woman. Peter asks in a very low voice, Do you think she knows? She knows everything. She has always been aware of everything. They all speak in very low voices, as if they were in front of a corpse. But do you think that really asks Thomas, who does not want to believe it yet. And do you doubt it? It is his hour, replies James of Zebedee. May God grant us strength to be faithful, says the zealot. Oh, I, says Peter, who is about to speak, but John, who is on the lookout, says, Silence, he is here. Jesus comes back in. He has the empty chalice in his hands. Only at its bottom there is a trace of wine, and in the light of the chandelier it looks just like blood. Judas Iscariot, in front of whom is the chalice, looks at it as if he were enchanted. Then he averts his eyes. Jesus watches him and shudders. And John leaning as he is on his chest, feels it. Why not say so? You are shivering, he exclaims. No, I am not shivering because I am feverish. I have told you everything, and I have given you everything. I could not have given you anything less. I have given you myself. He makes his usual kind gestures with his hands, which previously joined, now separate and stretch out, while he bows his head, as if he wished to say, Excuse me, if I cannot give you more, it is so. I have told you everything, and I have given you everything, and I repeat, the new rite has been accomplished. Do this in remembrance of me. I have washed your feet to teach you to be humble and pure like your master, because I solemnly tell you that disciples must be like their master. Remember that. Bear it in mind. Also, when you are in high offices, remember that. There is no disciple greater than his master. As I washed you, do the same to one another. That is, love one another like brothers, 
helping and respecting one another, setting an example to one another, and be pure, and to be worthy of eating the living bread that descends from heaven, and have the strength in yourselves and through it to be my disciples in the hostile world that will hate you because of my name. But one of you is not pure. One of you will betray me. My spirit is deeply perturbed by that. The hand of him who will betray me is here with me on this table, and neither my love nor my body and blood nor my word make him mend his ways and repent. I would forgive him going to my death also on his behalf. The disciples cast terrified glances at one another. They scrutinize one another. Suspiciously, Peter stares at the Iscariot in a revival of all his doubts. Judas Thaddeus, in his turn, jumps to his feet to look at the Iscariot above Matthew's body. But the Iscariot is so sure of himself. In his turn, he looks at Matthew as if he suspected him. He then looks fixedly at Jesus, and smiling, he asks, is it I, perhaps? He seems to be the one who is most certain of his honesty and to say so, not to let the conversation drop. Jesus repeats his gesture, saying, You are saying so, Judas of Simon, not I. You are saying so. I have not mentioned your name. Why are you accusing yourself? Ask your internal warner your conscience of a man, the conscience that God the Father gave you that you might behave as a man, and listen whether it accuses you. You will be the first to know. But if it reassures you, why do you utter a word and speak of a deed that is anathema, even to mention or to think of as a joke? Jesus is speaking calmly. He seems to be supporting a proposed thesis as a learned man may do with his pupils. The confusion is great, but Jesus' calm appeases it. But Peter, who is the most suspicious of Judah, perhaps Thaddeus also is so, but he does not look so. Disarmed as he is by the Iscariot's easy manners, plucks John's sleeve and when John, who has pressed against Jesus, upon hearing him speak of betrayal, turns round, he whispers to him, Ask him who it is. John takes his precious position again. He only raises his head slightly, as if he wanted to kiss Jesus, and in the meantime he whispers in his ear, Master, who is it? And Jesus, in a very low voice, kissing him in his turn on his head, says, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread dipped in the dish. And taking another entire loaf, not the remains of the ones he used for the Eucharist, he detaches a large morsel, he dips it into the lamb sauce left in the tray and says, Take it, Judas. You like this. Thank you, Master. I do like it. And unaware of what that morsel is, he eats it, while John, horrified, closes even his eyes not to see the horrid smile of the Iscariot as he bites the accusing bread with his strong teeth. Well, now that I have made you happy, Go, says Jesus to Judas. Everything has been accomplished. Here, he lays much stress on the word. What is still left to be done elsewhere, do it quickly. Judas of Simon. I will obey you at once, Master. Then I will join you at Gethsemane. You are going there, are you not, as usual? Yes, I am going there as usual. What has he got to do? asks Peter. Is he going by himself? 
I am not a baby, says Judas scoffingly, as he puts on his mantle. Let him go. He and I know what must be done, says Jesus. Yes, Master, Peter is silent. Perhaps he thinks he has committed a sin, suspecting his companion, resting his forehead on the palm of his hand. He becomes pensive. Jesus presses John to his heart and whispers again through his hair, Say nothing to Peter for the time being. It would be a useless scandal. Goodbye, Master. Goodbye, friends, says Judas, greeting them. Goodbye, replies Jesus. And Peter says, Goodbye, boy. John, his head almost on Jesus' lap, whispers, Satan. Jesus alone hears him and sighs. Everything comes to an end here. But Jesus says, I am inter interrupting the vision out of pity for you. I will give you the end of the supper later.